Good day and welcome to the final installment in GTPA's e-commerce series. The series forms part of our Business Health Check webinar series. I'm Collins Rex and uh, I'll be your host for this session. Um, just a reminder, as always, these sessions are recorded and we will make the recordings available via social media channels and various others at the end of the session and um, over the next couple of days. So without further ado, let's uh, think about where we're going to go today. So today's session is all about fulfillment and logistics. It's pretty much the last link in the chain when uh, we're looking at the e-commerce piece. As always, I draw your attention to the disclaimer. Remember, this information is uh, of a general nature. It's for information only. And if you do choose to use anything that we talk about today or indeed in any of our sessions for your business purposes, please make sure that um, it's relevant to your business and that you get professional advice to make sure that it is so. So today's session is all about getting the goods into your customers' hands, getting them there on time and in good order. And I cannot stress enough the good order component. And if uh, you look at the illustration, you'll also see that sometimes that last mile of getting the final step to get the goods into your customers' hands can be a little bit fraught. So please take that into account. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about establishing a robust supply chain, the evolution of logistics in-house versus third-party logistics, third-party logistics and fulfillment, warehousing in market and localizing your manufacturing and a few other bits and pieces along the way. So let's start off with that all-important supply chain and I think something that has been snapped into focus over the last few months as the world has been battling the COVID-19 crisis has been the importance of supply chains and of course the severe disruption of supply chains in many cases. So what do you do if you are trying to establish a supply chain that you know will withstand shocks? Number one is to build strong relationships. You need to build really strong relationships with both your suppliers and your buyers. Now, if you're selling on e-commerce, it's probably a little bit more difficult to build those personal relationships with your buyers unless you are selling in bulk and you just happen to be using e-commerce as the channel to market. However, if you are having to purchase in any kind of good as part of your supply chain, you do need to foster the strongest possible relationship with your suppliers, whether that be end products that you are on selling or components that you are using as part of your manufacturing process, or indeed packaging that you might be purchasing that is intrinsic to your good. It is very important that as part of this relationship, you communicate really well with your suppliers and with your buyers. It is really vital that everybody understands what is required, when it's required, how it's required, how it is going to be transported, etc. The more clearly you communicate, the less risk there is that something is going to fall through the cracks. Now, having said that you need a strong relationship with your suppliers, you absolutely do, but you also need a diversity of supply. So that means you don't build a really strong relationship with, with just one supplier, you build a strong relationship with a number of different suppliers across a number of geographic areas. That way, if one area is impacted by a crisis, you can switch to a different one. If one supplier cannot deliver for whatever reason, they cannot supply on time at the right price, you have another one. And there's no reason why you need to hide these relationships from your suppliers. It's all fine and well for them to understand that they are not the only link in the chain. Bear in mind that any supplier worth his or her salt is going to try to convince you to put all your eggs into their basket 
you really do need to resist that. And again, the COVID-19 crisis has shown very clearly how dangerous it is to get all your supply from one place or indeed to source all your customers from one place. Now, the only way that you can communicate properly, the only way that you can really build strong relationships, and the only way you can really understand your business is to start with good data. You need to understand your business fundamentally from end to end, and you also need to understand your supply chain and how it works from end to end. The information you output is only as good as the data that you get in. So it is very important that you understand and you have robust systems in place to collect data. Data about your suppliers, data about your stock levels, data about your order levels, data about your customers, what they're buying, when they're buying, seasonality, etc. It is also very, very important, and I cannot stress this enough, if you are going to establish an ethical supply chain to know the provenance of everything you purchase. You need to know where it comes from. You need to know how it was manufactured. You need to be ensured that you understand that everything has been done in an above board way, that there is no issue around modern slavery, for example. And we're not going to go into details about modern slavery today. We have touched on it in the past. And if we feel there is a necessity, we might run a special session on ethical supply and then we'll look at things like modern slavery, um, a number of other issue, issues that play into that ethical supply. But you as a purchaser of goods and an on-seller of goods need to know where everything in your chain originates because ultimately you will be responsible for everything downstream from you to those upstream from you. So bear that in mind. Also integrate your systems. So we've talked extensively in the past about CRM systems, for example, and how those need to integrate with the other processes and procedures that you have in place. It is vitally important that you integrate all the systems that in any shape, size or form are involved in buying goods, manufacturing goods, on selling goods. Because if your various parts of your system don't speak to each other, there is just too great a margin for error to creep in. So let your accounting system speak to your CRM system, let your order process be part of your accounting system, etc. Also bear in mind that you have to operate a business profitably, which means you have to take into account cost effectiveness. And you might have to balance flexibility and resilience with cost effectiveness. Sometimes there's going to be a trade-off. You might not get the best price if you want the fastest service. So you might have to compromise on the service a little. However, if you want the fastest service, you might be prepared to pay a bit more because it's going to gain you customers at the end of the day. But again, the data is all important. If you've got all the information, you can make informed decisions. And very importantly, always have a backup plan. Don't assume that you are going to be able to buy a certain component, for example, in your manufacturing chain from a certain place, because if you can't get that one thing from that one place, you could be in a world of pain. So always have a backup plan, always have an alternative supplier, always have an alternate way of getting what you need so that you can fulfill your order process and satisfy the relationship that you have with your customer. Now I'm going to pause for a moment to talk about artificial intelligence, simply because this is something which is becoming increasingly apparent in the trade world. In fact, in the business world as a whole, artificial intelligence is making a lot of systems and processes more streamlined, more efficient, and they are not necessarily out of reach of the small business person. So bear in mind that there have been enormous strides in AI and in machine learning in recent times. These various innovations offer manufacturers the tools they need to make smarter inventory management decisions and also to improve productivity and create more consistent supply chains in the process. 
The advantage that AI and machine learning has is that they can analyze thousands of data inputs in a moment, which means more insightful recommendations, telling you when is the best time to replace the parts in your machinery, for example, when your supply is going to run out long before it does, what your customers are purchasing from a seasonality perspective, for example, and what you need to do now to deal with those additional supply issues in the future so that you are ready to supply when your customers need. Predictive analytics mean that manufacturers can use AI to monitor existing inventory and also to provide customers with active recommendations and remote monitoring services so that there's a much greater ROI. It all just speaks to being proactive. It connects you, your supply chain, end to end, all your processes and all your procedures. If you do use an intelligence supply chain, there are three main advantages. You get the right products, parts, services available where and when they needed, and you know that ahead of time so that you can plan. You can balance your customer service and your budget so that you don't have downtimes and you don't incur penalties. And of course, it empowers faster upstream and downstream collaboration, irrespective of how complex your value chain is. It's worth having a look at um, AI just to see what is possible within your setup. And as I say, even if you're a really small business, there are various ways in which you can incorporate intelligent supply chains into your system without having to outlay a huge amount of cash up front. Now, logistics has changed substantially over the years. So in the 1970s, most retail stores were replenished by direct deliveries from suppliers or wholesalers, and it was all bricks and mortar. Now, of course, you did have a lot of mail order that was happening in the 1970s and way before then as well. As long as we've had a mail system, we've pretty much had parcels being posted from suppliers to buyers. But it all originated in bricks and mortar and it was all delivered and dealt with in that way. In the 1980s, retailers started to centralize their store deliveries through new distribution centers, which they controlled. So instead of goods going directly to individual stores, they went to a central distribution center. And from there, they were then sent through to the individual stores. In the 1990s, global sourcing took off, and this is mostly for non-food products. Many retailers developed import centers to receive and process mostly containerized imports. So instead of just having a centralized distribution center, there was a centralized import center where goods came to, they came in in the containers, then they were sent to the distribution centers and then made their way downstream to the individual stores. Now, the major shift really came in 2000 and onwards when e-commerce started to really become a thing. E-commerce started to expand rapidly and there was pure play internet only retailers leading the way in establishing e-fulfillment distribution networks. So the major difference here is that fulfillment has changed its nature. It has gone from purely physical to an, an online environment, if you like. And there are stores that sell online that never have bricks and mortar at all. There's never a place where you can walk in, fit, etc. And that is the major difference that has occurred. So logistics in the 2000s um, looks, as you can see it there, it's an interconnected system, it's an end-to-end -end system, and it looks quite different from the way in which some of us would have grown up with these issues. And you've got delivery to customers' homes, to delivery points, and to collection points, and returns work in pretty much the same way. Now, today we're going to be talking about the differences between in house fulfillment and logistics versus third party fulfillment and logistics. And we're going to spend most of our time talking about 3PL. So, 3PL, exactly what it says third party logistics. 
So in-house order fulfillment is the handling of all parts of the e-commerce order fulfillment process without seeking the help of any third-party solution providers. So essentially, you do it all. The process involves picking and packing orders, storing and managing inventory, shipping the products to the end customers, and also handling returns. So you've got your own network entirely. You control every component of it, but it also means that you have to do every component of it. Third-party order fulfillment is outsourcing the retail order fulfillment process to a team of outside experts. So this includes receiving orders, picking, packing, inventory management, shipping, warehousing, and very importantly, also returns. Now, the pros of in-house fulfillment is that you're completely in control. You control every part of, of the process. You pull all the strings. You also therefore know exactly what is going on, or you should do. <laughs> it's suitable for smaller volumes. It's not very practical if you are shipping massive orders. You can personalize your packaging. That's absolutely a pro. So you can put little personalized notes inside. You can choose different tissue paper for different garments if you're a garment supplier, etc., etc. Of course, you gain experience because you get to understand your business fundamentally from end to end. And very importantly, you get to know your customer because you deal directly with your customer. So you get to understand who your customer is, what their likes and their dislikes are, et cetera. And it also means you can fine tune your production to serve the needs of those customers. And that is very important. On the downside though, it takes a lot of time. It is incredibly time consuming to handle in-house order fulfillment. As a business owner, you will understand if you do this yourself, that it detracts from your core business because it does take a long time to do the sorting, the picking, the packing, the packaging, to take it down to the post office, for example, to post it, etc., or to load it on a truck yourself and so forth. It's not a viable option as your order book grows. The only way that it remains viable is if you spend a lot of money and you invest in staff, in facilities, in systems, and you mechanize some of the stuff. It is distracting. You are in the business of doing business. You are not in the business of packing stuff and putting boxes in people's hands. Ultimately, you are a manufacturer of garments or a creator of artwork. Um, you are that business. You are not the business of order fulfillment and logistics. And also, very importantly, if you do it all yourself, you are also responsible for every component of it. And that can have some very fundamental drawbacks. Now, in the case of 3PL, the pros, you get to work with those in the know. These are experts. They know their stuff. You don't even have to think about it, really, because they'll do all the thinking for you. You can concentrate on your core business, which is the business that you're in, after all. So you can concentrate on getting your line sorted out, new products, etc. That's what you do. You can minimize your facilities. You don't need the big warehouse with all its, its incumbent infrastructure. You can reduce the number of staff that you have because you don't have people picking orders, packing orders, etc. And of course, it's an overhead management tool. You know exactly how your input and your output is structured. You don't have to have massive facilities. You don't have to have lots of staff. All of those things that add to the cost items are reduced. On the downside, is loss of control. You no longer control every component of this process and you no longer control the relationship with your customers. That is taken largely out of your hands. There are hidden responsibilities though. So you never hands off entirely, this has got nothing to do with me, I'm not responsible. There's always components of this that you are still responsible for, but it's not necessarily apparent. So it's up to you to understand where your responsibility ends and the responsibility of your service provider starts and vice versa. And it can be expensive, particularly setup fees can be pretty steep to start off with. So you need to understand how that's going to impact your cash flow. 
So when we look in more detail at 3PL, not all 3PL is equal. There are different variations and there are different grades, if you like, of service that is provided. Starting with the full service 3PL solution. This is the whole bang shoot, all the bells and whistles that you can possibly think of. This is everything taken out of your hands and done by somebody else other than just you coming up with the goods. Inventory intelligence. So they recommend where your inventory should be stored in order to be close to the customers. So that doesn't necessarily mean that if you are in Australia, for example, your inventory will be stored in Australia. It could be stored in the United States if that's where the bulk of the customers sit. If you are based in the United States, your inventory could sit in Mexico, for example. Brand fulfillment experience. These guys will decide how fast orders are delivered and they will stand out with marketing inserts and all sorts of other bits and pieces that they add in. Generally, packaging is included with a pick rate, or you can supply your own branded packaging if you want to. That is entirely up to you. It's easy to integrate. So there's no technical integration required because it's all done hands off. Same day fulfillment is generally an option that is offered by full service providers. And that means that orders received by a certain cutoff time are shipped out on the same day. And of course, that's really handy if you need to get goods into the hands of your customers quickly. Do bear in mind that that service will come at a premium price. So then we look at the next level, which is warehouse and distribution based 3PLs. So these are essentially warehouses that distribute on your behalf. They're the most common type of 3PL. They store, they ship, and they handle returns. Now, when you are thinking of entering into an agreement with such a service provider, you need to look at a few things. Consider where their warehouses are. So what is their network like? Is it going to be efficient for your goods to reach your end customers based on where these warehouses are? What is the pricing? How expensive is it going to be and what is included in the price that they quote you? What are the shipping carrier rates that they are charging you? It might be more expensive to do it this way than to do it yourself, even with the incumbent infrastructure that you have to put in. Insurance. What is the insurance that is provided? Who is responsible for that insurance and how much extra does it cost? Daily cutoff time for fulfilling orders. So if you get your orders in by 10 a.m., do they go out on the same day? If you miss that 10 a.m. cutoff time, when do your orders go out? It might not necessarily be the next day. You might find that the fine print states that then it takes two or three days longer. You need to understand that. And of course, the delivery service levels. How are they servicing your account? How important are you to them? Where are the people that deal with your queries? Is it a service center somewhere in a time zone that you can't access, for example? And then, of course, what management tools do they have? And how do those management tools integrate with any of your systems to make it as seamless as possible end to end? And then the final level down really is those transportation-based 3PLs. So transportation-based 3PLs really just shuttle goods between locations. So here we have providers, for example, like DHL, FedEx, UPS. Goods are collected from one point, goods are taken to another point. Again, consider the origin location. So where are the goods being collected? Where are you based, in other words? And then the destination location, where are the goods going to? Because very often that will determine the service provider that you choose, because again, they're not all equal. Some are better at getting goods to certain geographical locations than others. So you need to understand that. What are the time frames? How long is it going to take from the time that you've had a, an order picked up from your location to get into your customer's hands? That could be a game changer for you. If you can get it more quickly to your customer, your customer will probably choose you. What are the shipping methods that are used? Are these things going on overnight uh, aircraft? Um, 
if they're going not necessarily cross border, but within the borders of a country, how are they getting there? Are they going van? Are they going truck? Are they going rail, for example? You need to understand that because that is going to affect not just the timing of your delivery, but also the way in which you need to pack your goods to ensure that your goods arrive in good order on the other end. If it's going in an aeroplane, it's going to be handled in a certain way. If it's going on a train, it's going to be handled in a different way. So how often is this package going to be thrown about and flung about? What does it mean in terms of the documentation that you need and so forth? The service levels, again, vitally important. What level of service do you require? Maybe you don't really need to be taken care of that much. Maybe you just need something collected, shipped, and that's it. Maybe you need a more involved relationship. So you need to choose accordingly. And of course, you need to understand what you're being charged for. And very importantly, you need to understand if there are any discounts that you could be calling on. So are there bulk discounts, for example? If you ship more than X number of packages every week, do you get a better rate? That sort of thing. Now, how do you choose a provider, irrespective of whether you go full service or you just go transportation? Well, here's a bit of a checklist for you. Um, it's fairly standard stuff, really, but it's stuff that very often we don't always think about when we enter into these relationships. So what is the area of expertise? In other words, do they understand your business? If you're a food and beverage exporter, for example, do they understand how to deal with perishable goods or goods that are fragile, for example? What is the credibility of the service provider that you're looking at? If you are going to have a credible relationship with your end customer, you also need to understand and have full faith in your provider that they are credible, that they know what they're doing, that they have a good reputation, uh, that they're not likely to go out of business and leave you high and dry. What is the network of locations that they service and where they are in fact located? Because the wider the network, the quicker the goods can get there. That might not be important to you, but you need to understand it because it could become important. Price, what are they charging you? What are they charging you for? Is their pricing structure clear? Is it transparent? Because you need to understand what you're paying for. If your provider will not tell you what you're paying for, if they won't give you an itemized pricing system, you need to wonder about their credibility. What customer service levels do they provide? And is that sufficient for your needs? What is their safety record like? And here we're talking about occupational health and safety issues, but we're also talking about the safety of transport, etc. So what is their record? If they've had any issues in the past, if there have been lawsuits against them, for example, that will be a matter of public record. Now, generally, the biggest providers, the, the, the usual suspects, tick these boxes pretty well, but you might want to be looking at a niche provider. So you need to ask the questions. What is the technology that they use? Does it integrate with your own systems and processes? If it's something which is a bespoke system and by using that, you are effectively locked into buying something else as an add on to your own, et cetera, it could cost you a lot more than is necessary. How efficient are they? So what is their track record? And generally, you can find that information quite quickly. And all importantly, since it's ultimately about getting goods from your hands into the hands of your buyer, what freight management systems do they use? What is their track record? How efficient are they? Now, there are some things that you need to think about, whether you go in-house or 3PL. Any e-commerce business needs to take into account your own ordering process. What is it? Do you actually understand your own process? If you don't, you need to figure that stuff out. How do you manage your inventory? Are you kind of waiting for an order to come in before you order in stock? Or do you always have stock sitting on a shelf and eventually it's outdated and you have to discount it to move it? How do you manage your inventory and how can you make it more efficient? 
what is your order fulfillment process? So from the time an order comes into you from a custom to the time it goes out, all the links along that chain, how do you deal with that process? Because to a large extent, that will also determine how you are going to choose a supplier or a provider. And very importantly, how do you deal with returns? Because sooner or later, goods are going to come back to you. How do you deal with that? You need to understand that because that is going to be part of your decision-making process when you choose a provider. I'm going to talk a little bit about warehousing in country. Obviously, if yours is a really small business, this probably doesn't apply to you. But if you're a larger business and you're planning to ship a significant volume to a single country, your own warehouse in that country gives you control over every aspect of fulfillment. You need to locate your warehouse in that case where most of your international customers are. So let's look at things that you need to consider if that applies to you. You need to think about location. So where are you going to locate the warehouse? And that will be determined by where you need to get most of your goods to. What are the staff facilities that are available in that location and how do you deal with that? What are the health and safety standards like in that country? Are they commensurate with your own countries? And if not, how do you ensure that they meet your expectations? And of course, you need to think about language difficulties when you are communicating with site management. If the location is in an area that speaks a language other than your native tongue, you might have a problem with that. So you need to think about that from a staffing perspective on the other side. Now, we're not going to go into any more detail other than to say there is help available. The International Warehouse Logistics Association can help with a lot of information, background stuff, and also helping to set up warehouses, source them, and so forth. And you can see the address on your screen. So have a look at that. It's interesting, if nothing else. Again, looking at the bigger end of businesses, looking at localizing manufacture. If you sell a product that relies more on branding than precision manufacturing, so it's a commodity, in other words, um, you just need lots of it, you may want to consider local manufacturing, which means manufacturing in the country where most of your customers are. This is particularly attractive if you're selling most of your product in one target market, and that market is far from your home base. So let's say, for example, you are situated in Poland. Most of your customers are in the United States. You want to consider having a facility to manufacture what you do provided. It's the sort of commodity that lends itself to that in the United States. Now, this minimizes shipping costs, of course, but you also need to weigh up the difference between the shipping costs and the costs of manufacturing goods locally. There has to be a balance there. You have to make the decision to manufacture locally because it makes sound business sense. Now, one of the reasons that you will consider manufacturing locally is if there is a free trade agreement in place and that free trade agreement might give you better market access, not just to the country with which you have the free trade agreement, but the countries with which that country has free trade agreements, for example. It could also give you preferential tariffs and so forth. So again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, just to make you think a little bit wider than just what you do today. And this is particularly important if your business is growing steadily and you are going to get to a point where it's big enough for you to start thinking about these issues. So in-country warehousing, localizing manufacturing. Big business needs to take this into account. Now, I do just want to pause on 4PL. Everything we've talked about today relates to 3PL, and that's what most of you will be using. However, 4PL is a fourth party logistics provider. So it essentially takes 3PL a step further. What 4PL providers do is they manage your entire operation. 
they manage the resources, the technology, all the infrastructure, and they will also manage your 3PL providers to ensure that you design, build, and provide supply chain solutions that are appropriate to your business. Again, if you're a really large business or you are a very rapidly growing business and you're struggling to keep up with not just getting goods into the hands of your customers, but also managing your facilities, setting up your facilities, and that relates to your manufacturing facilities as well, you might want to think about getting a full service provider, someone that essentially provides a turnkey service and go the 4PL route. So no more to say about that other than to draw your attention to the fact that this exists and it may become appropriate to you and your business if your business outgrows its current model. Now, just a word on pricing. We talked extensively last week about how you price appropriately for selling online so that you still make a, a reasonable margin and therefore can actually grow your business and maintain your business. But there are other things you need to be aware of when it comes to logistics and fulfillment. If you're shipping from your own international warehouse, be aware of all the extra fees involved like customs, duties, taxes, tariffs. And you also need, very importantly, to understand how to correctly classify your product. We're not going to go into detail today about HS codes. That is a conversation for another day and it doesn't just apply to e-commerce, it applies to all cross-border trade. I will give you a link in a moment to where you can get more information. Major carriers have simplified how they calculate shipping costs. Um, so the DHLs of this world, the FedExes of this world, etc., provide very detailed shipping guides on cross-border shipping. So your provider will be able to give you a really good breakdown of what is included and what needs to be included in these cross-border shipping costs. Now do bear in mind that if you get it wrong, Inaccurate tax and tariff calculations will result in extra fees, almost certainly in shipping delays, possibly fines and penalties from regulatory authorities. Of course, your profit margin is eroded, your customer trust is down the gurgler, but also there's a very good chance that your reputation in that market is going to be damaged for a very long time to come. Just about every country in the world has a tariff tool. So you export from X country to Y country. There is a tool available in your country, almost certainly, that will tell you what that tariff is and how to calculate it. If there is such a tool available, use it. It really will make your life a lot simpler. And very importantly as well, you need to think about currency. Think about the price that you are putting on your good and whether you are pricing in your own currency or in a multitude of currencies. If you are going to be pricing in a multitude of currencies, please understand that the exchange rate varies all the time. Not just every day, but literally all the time. You need to be very closely aligned with that currency rate to understand what is happening to the price of your good and the margin that you are making on that good. If you get it wrong, you could lose money. You could also seriously annoy your customers. Understand how this affects your profit margin. We're not here to give you a Forex lesson other than to draw your attention to the fact that if you do not price appropriately in a currency that you can control, you could be in trouble from a pricing perspective. Also, make it very clear to your customers what you are pricing in. Do not assume that your customers will know that if you have a dollar sign in front of a price, that that is US dollars. 
do not assume that if you're an Australian business and you have a dollar sign that your customers will know you are pricing in Australian dollars and not US dollars, for example. You need to make it clear that you are pricing in USD or AUD or in whichever other currency in the world you might be pricing so that you can control what it is your customers see, what it is your customers pay. And also understand how that is going to affect all your tariffs, your duties, your taxes, etc. Be very aware of what currency is going to do and get specialist advice. You are not a foreign exchange dealer. You are in the business of making and selling goods. Get somebody else to deal with the foreign exchange issues. Now, some general resources for you to uh, access. I mentioned Inco terms. Um, no, I didn't, did I? I mentioned HS codes. But Inco terms are also very important. Inco terms that determine who has responsibility for the carriage of goods and where that responsibility shifts from buyer to seller. If you're not familiar with what an INCO term is, go and look it up. There's the address. Um, it is the ICCs, the International Chamber of Commerce. They set the rules. They have detailed information and also education resources. So if you're not sure, go there. For the classification of goods, which is the HS code system, again, there's an address there for you to go to. Those are set by the World Customs Organization. It is the code that relates to every good, irrespective of what it is, where it is. If it's moving from one country to another, it has a code. And that code denotes all manner of characteristics around that good. And foreign exchange. If you are not familiar with foreign exchange, and very few of us are, in fact, very few of us want to be, go and look at the glossary of foreign exchange terms. It is an American site. If you get to it, it will probably tell you from wherever location you are that you are trying to access this and you're not in the United States. Do you want to go ahead, say yes, and then have a look at it. It's a really comprehensive glossary of foreign exchange terms, and it will make a lot of things clear. Of course, in making them clearer, it could also confuse the issue, but it will help you to have an informed conversation with your foreign exchange provider. So that brings us to the end of today's session. And all that remains is to see if there are any questions. I haven't had any questions ahead of time today, and I think I've probably stunned you all into submission. So <laughs> I don't see any questions popping up in the Q&A panel. So we'll assume that there are no questions for today. And I'm then going to move on to drawing a conclusion to today's session. Um, there won't be a business health check webinar in October for the whole of the month of October. No business health check webinars. We will recommence those in November. But there's some very exciting stuff coming for the month of October. And I'm delighted today to officially announce the Festival of Inclusive Trade. From the 16th to the 31st of October, you'll be able to attend over 60 different business and creative events, all online and all free. And um, we're very excited about that. Watch your inbox and all the usual social media channels for details, or feel free to email me, um, not just to find out what is happening, but there is still an opportunity or two for you to be involved in the festival uh, as a speaker, as a panelist, or indeed as a creator of a creative work. So feel free if, um, if you still keen on that. And if you go to, to our website, um, you'll get some details there. And as I say, watch your inboxes, watch the socials, because we will soon be publishing the full festival schedule and you'll be able to register online for all of the events around the festival. So remember, no webinars for October. We recommence webinars in November and in October, the Festival of Inclusive Trade. As always, if you need any general advice or help around your business, um, around certification standards, etc. visit the GTPA website. Um, we have any number of resources there that you can access. And if you have a specific question that you'd like to raise, feel free to email me. And if in my absence, you can email my colleague, Lisa, but I'm generally your first port of call for all of these things. If I don't have the answers, I'll find someone who does. Thank you very much for your attention today. As always, it was good to see some familiar names online. 
and some new ones as well. I look forward to having you as part of the Festival of Inclusive Trade over the month of October. And again, at these webinars, having your company in November. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a lot of fun as always. And um, have a good day. Stay safe. And as always, remember to take care of yourself and those you love. Goodbye.